your presentation and go ahead. I hope you enjoy, really enjoy this lecture by Dr. Ashraf Tayyar. Unmute yourself, Dr. Ashraf, please. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, bismillah rahman rahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid, for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, let me, yeah, okay. Uh, this topic is really very important and interesting for everybody working in ICU. Uh, as we know, heart failure can be managed by many specialities. So you as intensivist or anesthesiologist, ER physicians, internal medicine, cardiologists, of course. So heart failure, when the heart fails, it can fail anywhere in the world, in the OR, in ER, in, in ICU, at home. But there is a universal definition for heart failure, which is, as I mentioned, universal. So you're going to see this definition everywhere, regardless of the guidelines you see or the uh, review anybody is doing is going to be at the end of the day what the heart is defined to be failing or failed when you have a clinical syndrome of a context or constellation of signs and symptoms of congestion and low cardiac output or hypoperfusion due to structure and or functional cardiac damage that as i mentioned results in or results from a low cardiac output state and or increase intracardiac filling pressures of both atria, both ventricles, right and left. But at the end, as I mentioned, the heart will be defined as failing. And the patients, regardless of the heart failure, would present with certain signs and symptoms. Also universally, and it doesn't matter whom you are talking about heart failure or dealing with heart failure, you're going to end by having your patient with heart failure in one of two types. Either the heart fail because of the systolic function is not enough to maintain and to keep coping with the uh, body need of blood bombed to every single tissue or cell in the body. This is what we call it systolic heart failure, what we used to call it before forward heart failure or hypoperfusion heart failure or low cardiac output heart failure or low ejection fraction heart failure as the latest definition heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So when the ejection fraction, the amount of the blood which, which is ejected with each systole, the difference between the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume divided by the end diastolic volume times 100. This is the ejection fraction. And the other type, which is with maintained systolic function, but the diastolic function of the heart is in bare. Like the diastole, in diastole, the heart has to relax to receive the blood coming from the atria and the atria relax to receive the blood coming from pulmonary circulation, pulmonary veins when you're talking about left atrium and IVC superior vena cava when you're talking about the right atrium. If the heart failed to relax and to give a room for the blood coming back to the chambers, then we call this diastolic heart failure or we used to call it before, a couple of years back, a backward heart failure or congestion heart failure. Both of them can present with the same sign and symptoms at the end of the day, but it's a very, very important to differentiate if this is systolic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or with preserved ejection fraction or what we call a diastolic heart failure. There is very recently also another sub subdivision 
of heart failure, of group of heart failure patients, when the ejection fraction is not that impaired, impaired but not less than 40%, and it's not above 50%, between 40 to 49% ejection fraction, we call it mid-range ejection fraction. So heart failure, HF, MR ejection fraction, mid-range between 40 to 49 heart uh, ejection fraction. And the, the percentage in the literature usually is between 50% here and 50% there. There is no uh, uh, solid data about this. Etiologists are very variable. When you're talking about reduced ejection fraction or reduced systolic function, the most common reason for this is usually ischemic heart disease, MI, arrhythmias, but when the ejection fraction is preserved or this, the diastolic function of the heart is impaired, this is most likely, the most likely reason for this is hypertension, valvular heart disease, and commonly associated with EF uh, from the arrhythmia. Comorbidities are there in both types, but it's more common when it's obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, as I mentioned, diabetes, anemia, renal disease, you find this comorbidity is more toward the diastolic heart failure uh, uh, more than the uh, uh, ejection, uh, reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Also, it's encountered in the literature to see a link between hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, cardiac stiffness, fibrosis, and many other uh, things that result in impairment of cardiac systole and diastole. Hypertensive heart failure per se is, well, is, is, is uh, very important to know that if you control the blood pressure, you reverse totally the diastolic dysfunction or heart failure. So it's a very reversible. And this is, carries a message to everybody working in ICU. And I'm gonna to touch tonight everything related to the ICU point of view, because I'm not cardiologist, but I'm dealing with the heart in ICU every single moment in different indications. As we used to say, the most common reason for respiratory system to fail is cardiovascular failure. And the most common reason for the cardiovascular failure to fail is respiratory failure. Kidney, when it fails, it affects the heart. Heart, when it fails, it affects the kidney. So we in ICU have to know details about the heart, and that's why we should not allow hypertension in ICU, particularly during the weaning time and many other situations. The basophysiologically, the consequences to acute heart failure or acute heart decompensation is that you're gonna see a lot of neurohormonal changes happens immediately with the heart failure. And we see this very frequently in ICU. Like you see sympathetic overactivity. How many times you round on your, on your patients in ICU and you see them tachycardic? This tachycardia, one of the differential diagnoses that sometimes it's underestimated is the presence of heart failure due to sympathetic overactivity when the cardiac output reduces. So, and also renin, angiotensin, aldosterone release with arginine, vasopressin disturbances, all of this will result in tachycardia, very high vascular, systemic vascular resistance sodium and water retention. This, at the end of the day, will result in ventricular remodeling of both ventricles and organ dysfunction. And this is the danger of that. There is what we call it, and, and you probably see this term in, in the reviews coming from intensivists, a congestion cascade. When the heart fails, there, there are many types of congestion or engorgement of the circulation. Number one, a hemodynamic congestion. When you're gonna have increasing cardiac and venous filling pressures, this is, will result in 
pulmonary edema, of course, but also the congested vessels and congested ventricles wouldn't contract, ventricles per se, wouldn't contract freely when it's congested. And we mentioned this in previous presentations several times that we have to understand the physiology very well of Frank Starling curve. The Frank Starling referred to that the myocardium as a, in general rule of any skeletal muscles will contract more as you increase its preload or the loading condition of this muscle. As much as you increasing the load or the preload for the left ventricle and right ventricle, either this preload is, vent is volume or pressure, the more you increase, the more you allow the muscles of the heart to stretch out. But you're gonna reach a maximum point when the ventricle or muscles wouldn't stretch more. And here you stop to have increasing cardiac output. If the ventricles are congested, the cardiac output eventually will reduce because the muscle will stop to contract more. Number two congestion, which is organ congestion, and the most commonly here and most disastrous one is the congestion happens at the level of the lung. And here you're gonna see the pulmonary edema. But when the other organs congest, you start to see renal impairment, hepatic impairment, and the, uh, eventually you're gonna see edema everywhere, peripherally, neck veins, and many other. This congestion, if it's on the left side, you're gonna see symptoms related to respiratory system, dyspnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, intolerance to uh, phys any physical activities, syncope, palpitation, uh, feeling uh, tiredness, fatigability, chest pain. But when the right side congestion happens, patients will start to complain of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, hepatojugular reflux, reflux will be very manifest and you see engorged neck veins and you see lower limb edema and uh, right mainly pleural effusion, but left pleural effusion also can happen. We have to be aware very, very cautiously about the signs of hypoperfusion in any patients with acute heart failure. Because once you see the signs of hypoperfusion, you would immediately notice that this patient would have both type of heart failure and not only systolic and not only diastolic. And the danger here is when you started to see hypoperfusion signs and symptoms, this will indicate that the cardiac output is impaired and this ventricle or this heart requires to be supported with inotropes. We all know the signs of hypoperfusion, starting from hypotension, optimization level of, at the level of the brain, you see a lot of evidence of hypoperfusion. Decreased urine output, capillary refill impairment, cold extremity, increase in lactate, decrease in central venous oxygen saturation, and increase in entidal BCO2 are found to be very specific and sensitive in acute heart failure. There are many conditions which comes with heart failure. And sometimes it's overwhelm, overwhelming our thinking when we see these things and we underestimate that there is underlying heart failure that need to be dealt with to treat the serious event that engaged or make your mind very busy stressing on and focusing on. Like you have heart failure and patient is, is also shocked. This is by the way, we don't call it only cardiogenic shock. Yeah, it might be pure cardiogenic shock with heart failure. Because as we mentioned in the definition, any heart failure, when it reaches the stage of hypoperfusion and impairment of the cardiac output, this patient by definition is in cardiogenic shock. And any cardiogenic shock is by default is in heart failure, definitely but also respiratory insufficiency due to heart failure or a reason for the heart to fail has to be in mind and one of the serious conditions that, that can come together. Also myocardial ischemia per se is a typical entity for a great attention, but when it's accompanied by heart failure, it makes, makes us more worried and it warrants a more focus or attention. When you have arrhythmia, EF, ventricular tachycardia, bigeminy, trigeminy, whatever it is, it makes the scenario more worse. What I'm focusing on this 
that we have to, in ICU, to be very vigilant, dealing with everything at the same time. We'll not focus on something and we'll forget uh, many other things. There are indicators of advanced heart failure that when you see them, you have to know, especially preoperatively, while you're managing to prepare your patient for surgery or something, anesthesia, then a class, New York Heart Association class of three or four, are very advanced indicator of advanced heart failure. When the ejection fraction is it, the less than 40%, more or less, more severe. When you have arrhythmia, hyponatremia, renal impairment, uh, increased need for diuretic doses and weight loss, these are signs and indicators of bad heart failure, actually, that warrant more attention. ICU admit a subset of heart failure that is severe heart failure. As I mentioned, when heart failure is accompanied by cardiogenic shock, arrhythmia, organ failure, uh, 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 respiratory failure, difficult to win. And I'm gonna show you scenarios of heart, fa of heart failure patients presenting in ICU in daily practicing how this manifests in ICU later on. But we see here that the cardiogenic shock associating a decompensate heart failure was found in different literature review and different surveys to range in different studies between 16 to 25%, around 25% of patients with heart failure in some of the literature present to ICU in cardiogenic shock. And this is very, very serious. Not only that, but also organ dysfunction. How many times we see heart failure and the main reason for the kidney to fail is the heart failure. The main reason to see ischemic hepatitis or, or fulminant hepatitis is that the heart is failing and the back pressure to the hepatic circulation and venous congestion caused, and also ischemia because of low cardiac output causes hepatitis, which is sometimes very fulminant. Mortality, ladies and gentlemen, is considered to be very high in heart failure. It reached in, 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 in some of the literature up to 25 to 50% of patients with decompensate heart failure, they might die. And this is very high percentage, by the way. How we diagnose heart failure in ICU? We rely on many things. What we're gonna focus today is that we should not forget the same things to expect or predict diagnosis, like history, history of patients, patients with hypertension, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, COPD, previous ischemic heart disease, previous echo with low ejection fraction, previous admissions with, with decompensate heart failure. This is, makes a lot in, in differential diagnosis. And clinical presentation. And as I mentioned, in ICU, we don't see patients with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea. What we see them when they are in respiratory failure, multi-organ failure, cardiogenic shock, as I mentioned before, we should not forget that lab is essential in diagnosis and prognostication of acute heart failure. Echocardiography, as Dr. Walid mentioned in, in my presentation, that echo is a mandatory in dealing with diagnosing and managing any patient with heart failure. How would you know heart failure if you don't have echo? Investigations as the routine one, cardiac enzymes, electrolytes, and kidney function, hepatic, these are all very important. But you have not to forget the lactate because the lactate is one of the very important laboratory sign of global hypoperfusion. So if you see the high lactate, this is very, very indicator of bad function of the heart and worsening systolic uh, f function of the heart or low cardiac output state. This is, this is very important. Not only that, but also propane B can be used to diagnose patients with acute decompensate heart failure in emergency situation. It's very sensitive when the propane B in cases which is confusing to be heart failure or not to be heart failure. When the propane B is less than 100 biconigram per ml, this is, is against acute decompensate heart failure. Once you see the uh, propane B is higher than 100, this is indicate a dilation of both atria and ventricles, 
and it's a good indicator of heart failure, especially in intensive care patients who are ready to wean, but then you question their cardiac function. Probe NB can, very sen can be very sensitive to give an indicator of good versus bad cardiac function. Plus, of course, as I mentioned, essentially the echocardiography examination. Of course, ECG can help. Radiologically, chest X-ray and lung ultrasound is considered also to be a very essential part and it's there in, in every recommendation and guidelines. Let's start with, by this radiologic uh, investigation, chest X-ray versus lung ultrasound. You need a modality to see the lung in any acute heart failure patients. Why to diagnose pulmonary edema? To differentiate if this is cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic and to see that there are some, if not many, cases that can come combined together, combined with cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic heart failure patients who is presenting as well with pneumonia or COPD exacerbation or many other things. So combined cases are considered to be not infrequent in critical ill patients. Also, you would see if you have pleural effusion. If I ask the question, a chest X-ray or lung ultrasonography, the answer comes from a many big body of literature to support that lung ultrasonography is considered to be more sensitive and more specific with good predictive values compared to chest X-ray. And chest X-ray is totally, totally insensitive and inspecific when it's compared to the gold standard, which is CT. Just lung ultrasonography is coming to be on the coming few years, if not few weeks or, or months, is, is coming to be as gold standard as the lung CT. Why? Because you can see everything that you would see with CT, you can see it with the uh, lung ultrasonography. Particularly, there are many investigations or research on comparing chest X-ray to lung ultrasonography, and lung ultrasonography was found to be superior in predicting the pulmonary edema. Look at this chest X-ray of a real life cases, which I had. This patient presented with respiratory failure, sign and symptoms, and he was desaturating. Look at the chest X-ray. Would you see anything suggestive of pulmonary edema here? Uh, the answer, I think you would agree with me, that there is no indication of bad wing congestion, hyalur congestion, parahyalur congestion, or uh, careless lines, or dilated cardiomyopathy, or dilated heart, or cardiomegaly. But look, when we have the ultrasound exam bilaterally, you would see here what we call it extensive B lines, a vertical line, commit tail, starting from the pleura, ending by the bottom of the screen, with erasing the A lines. This is typical criteria of B line. And when you see B line bilaterally, like this, with looking healthy, shiny, smooth, not dirty, plural line, you call this a confluent B line for a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, especially when you see them uh, uh, diff uh, di di diffusely distributed evenly bilaterally in both lungs, dunes you would say that this is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. On the other hand, when you see this chest X-ray, you wouldn't at all, in this patient who presented with hypoxia, and he was showing all signs and symptoms of a sepsis, feverish, white cell count is high, and the lung X-ray is typically showing a careless line here, cardiomegaly, bat wing congestion, bilaterally with redistribution into the the, uh, from center to periphery, typical for cardiogenic pulmonary edema on chest X-ray. When we do the lung ultrasonography, you will see clearly here that the left ventricle is badly contracting. The right ventricle is not that bad, but there is left atrial dilation here, indicating systolic and diastolic dysfunction. At the same time, when you look at the lung ultrasonography, you see part of the pleura is healthy, while the other part is corrugated, thickened, and adhesed with extensive B lines as well. This is, wouldn't be typically for cardiogenic pure pulmonary edema, but would be matching with a cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic as well. 
Look at here, this is the spleen, and this is the left lower lobe. It's totally consolidated with, you see here, a lot of white dots that does not disappear when inhalation happens, indicating collapse, and some of these white dots are dynamic that disappear with inhalation, indicating with these P lines that we have a wet lung consolidation in this weak left ventricle with systolic and diastolic dysfunction, so combined cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic, with no lung ultrasonography, with relying on plain X-ray, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Lung ultrasonography is also very helpful in prognostication of acute heart failure that studies, a lot of studies in the literature, and some of them are very recent, that the more you see B lines at time of, of discharge from ICU or from the, from the ward or from hospital room, the more you leave your patients with wet lung, the more you're going to have a higher rate of readmission and higher even mortality. And from this, patients has to be dry more than what we believe to be. Echocardiography is among 1A, 1C recommendation in every, recommend, every guidelines, European and American. Echocardiography is considered to be mandatory for every patient whom you suspect in ICU or outside of ICU that they have heart failure. You have to have echocardiography examination to define subjectively, we are using your eyeballing, or objectively when you have measurements that this patient has heart failure or doesn't have heart failure. And this heart failure is systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure because the management is totally different as I'm gonna show you later on. Let's go with the journey of heart failure. How can we use the echo to help quantifying and diagnosing acute heart failure? The first and very simple way to use is to use your eye to comment on the left ventricle and right ventricle and to comment in systolic function mainly is this patient's is left ventricle is contracting normally as you would see here in this loop of a uh, uh, heart that you see the endocardium thicken with every systole and the size of the left ventricle reduces significantly. Both of these signs are more than 30%, ex, uh, I mean, uh, thickening increase of the endocardium of the left ventricle muscles and decrease by more than 30% of the size of the left ventricle with each systole, this indicates normal systolic function. On the other hand, if you look at this left ventricle, you wouldn't have much effort to see that the size of the left ventricle here doesn't reduce much with each system. And if you look at the septum here, you wouldn't notice at all any change in the size of the muscle with contractility, but you would see a some change of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So I will diagnose here that this patient has systolic, by eyeballing, systolic dysfunction. And I would say that this is, might be mild, moderate, or severe left ventricle dysfunction, or ejection fraction less than 40%, or more than 50%, or between 40 and 50%. This is by eyeballing. How much you need as an effort to say that this patient's left ventricle here is dilated, as you see, not reducing in size, as you see, as you see here with the system. And the thickness of the muscle globally doesn't change much. So I wouldn't have any difficulty to say that this patient has severe, severe cardiomyopathy or hypokinesia, global severe hypokinesia. So and this patient ejection fraction is far away less than 40%. You might say that it's less than 20%. So there is no effort here. Look at this short axis, parasternal short axis. This is the left ventricle. This is the RVOT. This is the septum. You can see that the left ventricle is just flickering in movement with each systole. While on the other hand, you would see that the left ventricle is hyperkinetic and hyperdynamic. And the papillary muscles here are kissing. So this ventricle, by eyeballing, is on the extreme of the normality, which is hyperdynamic 
globally hyperdynamic left ventricle. We should not forget, and this is very important, and I would see, I would, I would uh, stress one of the very straightforward messages from tonight, that not every septic patient should have hyperdynamic left ventricle. This is an example of young gentleman, around 27 year old, who presented to us with septic shock, and after three or four days, the left ventricle turned to be from hyperdynamic to, as you see here, very hypodynamic. So what we call it septic cardiomyopathy. And this is if you have evidence of low perfusion on these patients who, are, who were septic, is now in cardiogenic shock or in heart failure. And if you feel, if you measure the filling pressure of this left ventricle here, you would see it very high because every systolic dysfunction is going to end by diastolic dysfunction, and every diastolic dysfunction is going to end by a systolic dysfunction. Sist diastolic dysfunction would be very well expected when you see a, a hypertrophic concentric left ventricle hypertrophy, and this doesn't need much uh, expert eyes to identify. Look at this is the left ventricle, and this is the uh, circumferentially the left ventricle muscle in short axis view, see it's a globally hyperkinetic and globally thickened, and this is what we call it left ventricle hypertrophy due to long-standing hypertension. Of course, there are some differential diagnosis has to be in mind, like amyloidosis and many other infiltrative heart disease, but if I have history of hypertension, this patient, I would expect hypertensive with left ventricle hypertrophy to have sort of diastolic dysfunction as we're gonna show you later. Also, you might see good systolic function, but with biatria dilation, as you see here, this patient would definitely has a high filling pressure, high pulmonary capillary with pressure and pulmonary edema, especially at the time of weaning from mechanical ventilation. So quantitative measurement using the eye polling was found to be very simple and it avoid the individual variation because you and me can agree that this is mild dyskinesia or mild global hypokinesia, and this is moderate, this is severe, the ejection fraction numbers doesn't matter. At the end of the day, bedside, I would say that this patient has a severe systolic dysfunction or moderate dysfunction or mild dysfunction. This needs in a trope, this doesn't need in a trope, and so on. There is evidence supporting this, that when, when we go with qualitative rather than quantitative, you do well and accuracy was tested very well with evidence that there was no big differences between the eyeballing and the quantitative measurements. But sometimes you need quantitative measurements to measure the cardiac output, and this is very easy in this uh, parasternal long axis when you have the uh, uh, M mode, and then you can measure the ejection fraction and fraction of shortening. And this is, both of them can be a reflector of systolic function, but ejection fraction doesn't equal cardiac output because ejection fraction is a regional systolic function assessment where you put the line and here you estimate the ejection fraction. Samson can be better, but there are a lot of uh, uh, drawbacks of Simpson that you have to have a very good orientation of the endocardium all over during the systole and diastole, which can be a little bit difficult job in ICU patients. You can measure the cardiac output when you measure the left ventricle outlet tract area in the long axis, as you see here, you freeze and you measure during the systole. You can have the area when you have the five chamber view and you put the pulsed wave doubler uh, uh, at in the uh, LVOT area away from the aortic valve, then you're gonna have the VTI, velocity time integral, through the uh, left ventricle outlet tract, and then you outline the area under the curve, it gives you the VTI. You, do, you times the VTI by surface area of the LVOT, it gives you the stroke volume, and then you can times this by heart, rate, it gives you the cardiac output. The machine can do everything for you automatically, as you see in this example. You can measure the cardiac output very non-invasively and very simply bedside, 
and it doesn't take time if you have good views. The cardiac output of the RV also should not be forgotten and should be measured because as you have the left ventricle failure, you might have the right ventricle failure and the same physiologic application is there. TAPC and MAPC, the annual excursion of both tricuspid and mitral valve are good indicator of systolic function of both RV and uh, LV. Diastolic function can be easily estimated when you have the mitral inflow with pulsed wave and you measure the E wave at the earliest diastole and you measure the A wave at late diastole before the systole. And this is IE E to A ratio. And when you use tissue doubler, you can have E to E prime when you put the tissue doubler at, and the pulsed wave at the annulus of both lateral and medial uh, mitral valve leaflet annulus and then you you take average of e to e prime this is very well good studied predictor of pulmonary capillary with pressure that uh, it will be very high indicates high filling pressure of the left ventricle and cardiogenic pulmonary edema due to diastolic dysfunction of course uh, we use the tricuspid regal jet to quantify the severity of diastolic dysfunction as well as the left atrial void. Management, ladies and gentlemen, has to be both diagnosis and treatment has to be hand in hand. You should not delay doing the necessary action to manage patients waiting to diagnose the heart failure or to do the echo or repeat the echo. But once you diagnose heart failure, you have to go with management, triaging them, categorizing them, those who have advanced heart failure and with severity that necessitate admission to ICU when they are in respiratory failure, cardiogenic shock, or multi organ failure, immediately admit to ICU. And as bear evidence of heart failure alone, or heart failure, low cardiac output alone, or low cardiac output with filling the pressures high, you have to deal with both. You have warm and dry patients, means they are perfused and they are not wet yet. So they are in heart failure, but still there is good perfusion, there is good uh, filling pressures. But you might have patient with high boob perfusion and they are still dry. They are not in pulmonary edema. This is cardiogenic shock patients. They are high perfused. They might be warm and wet, perfused, but they are congested or in pulmonary edema. They might be cold and wet. Cardiogenic shock will be high boob perfused and cold, and all cardiogenic shock are in pulmonary edema by default. And this is, has to be in mind when we're managing patients. Wet and dry, pulmonary and organ edema, then you have to use fluid removal by diuresis, by CRRT, and then you have to use cautiously vasodilators, and you have to consider mechanical ventilation, anti-failure medication, including ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Spironolactone has to be all in, in the package of managing acute heart failure with evidence that they are congested. If they have evidence that they have perfusion issues, then you have to think of using any tropes. And don't leave your, heart, your patient's heart suffering and you are underestimating that this patient's heart need enotropic support, dobutamine, levosimindan, or any melerinone or any other sort of uh, enotropic support should be indicated when you have evidence of low cardiac output, and this is, should not be delayed and should not be forgotten at all. That's why, again, this is one of the great messages that you have to see anatomically and functionally how is the left ventricle and right ventricle working, systole and diastole, because this is, will give you a clue when to start and when not to start uh, enotropic support. If you use enotropic support unnecessarily, they, because some, some, some of our colleagues, they go empirically and randomly and blindly, and they start the butamine for every patient's in heart failure in ICU. And this is dangerous because this was associated in the literature as one of them of this uh, literature supporting this, that it's associated with non-morbidity and mortality. You have to have evidence of low cardiac output, either invasive or non-invasive. And the goal for non-invasive measurement of the cardiac output is the echo, as I mentioned before. There are many other modalities 
like ECMO, cabbage, BCI, case by case, individual case, but you shouldn't stop. You shouldn't stop to refer patients for ECMO, central ECMO, VA, and you, you might save patients, especially uh, in postpartum, in, in post myocarditis, viral myocarditis. They are salvageable. They can survive and they can make it. Let me end my presentation by a few examples of uh, daily scenarios that we are facing in ICU. How many times, ladies and gentlemen, you have patients admitted to ICU with acute on top of chronic respiratory failure like my patient here? And the differential diagnosis of any acute on top of chronic respiratory failure in COPD patients, when they come with a, 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 a type 2 on top of chronic type 2, with BCO2 very high, BH is low, bicarb is high. And then the differential diagnosis includes infection, bronchospasm, pneumothorax, electrolyte, muscle weakness, and heart failure and pneumothorax. Here, look at this patient who stayed two days on non-invasive ventilation, treated with antibiotics and treated with bronchodilators and, and, and everything possible to come here, to bring him out of acute of chronic respiratory failure with no benefit because nobody cared to put a probe and see how, how is the left ventricle. Look at this left ventricle of this patient. There is no good systolic function here. The left ventricle is badly contracting. This is the long axis and this is the short axis. And look at the apical four. Also, you can see obvious mitral regurg. So this patient had and this is the ejection fraction. It's around only maybe 30%. And this is the, what we call it ASPP, the, the, the distance between the A-wave and the septum in diastole. And it indicates when it's more than one centimeter, bad systolic function. And the diastolic function with tissue doubler was showing E to A prime 32. This is the average, this is the lateral, and this is the medial. At, at, at average is above, far away, above 20. So very high pulmonary capillary oxygen pressure. And this patient needed heart failure management. And once we started the anti-failure medication, everything improved within 24 hours and patient discharged from ICU. Without echo, you wouldn't diagnose heart failure. You wouldn't see that this patient, any patient with respiratory failure should warrant a diagnostic echocardiography examination immediately after admission to ICU at any convenient time immediately after ICU admission. And also look at this patient who, who was in ICU. I rounded on him. I found him very tachycardic as you see here in the bedside monitor, 143. But he is comfortably breathing with a pressure support, breathing 18, saturation is 99%. But this patient is on positive pressure with this, persistently. And in spite of big doses of beta block, and big doses of calcium channel blocker. And this is another very straightforward message that beta blocker and calcium channel blocker should not be used blindly, especially in all the age patients. Look at this patient left ventricle and please comment on this. How would you comment by eyeballing on this left ventricle? This patient was in 10 milligram of propran, of, of uh, uh, Concord, 10 milligram. And he was on calcium channel, deltiazem. And all this was what we tried to control the heart rate, which remained 140 or more. This patient doesn't need beta blocker. He is in heart failure. And this ventricle cannot tolerate negative anatropicity of both calcium channel broker and even very selective beta blocker wouldn't tolerate. And what this patient needed actually is to improve the systolic function, is to come up with a medication that helps the systolic function of the left ventricle. And at the same time, you decongest him to allow the left ventricle to contract better. We started the juxin and we give him anti-failure medication and we stop beta blocker. Look at the heart rate after 24 hours of management. It came, it came very significantly down and patient was weaned from mechanical ventilator. I'm not saying that we are doing magic job, but this is what the job has to be done in ICU actually. We are not creating the wheels, but we have everybody working bedside in ICU has to bear in mind 
that it's not luxurious to look at any patients, especially those with any history or suggestions of having cardiac dysfunction to have eco examination for them. And it's not luxurious, it's mandatory for everybody working in ICU to have basic eco evaluation ability because this is mandatory. And what I'm saying is not what I, I, what I'm, what I, I say, but it's, it's the words of recommendations and guideline everywhere in the literature. You can see that the jocks can be still in the recommendations as to be recommendations. In European and American, they don't go much with the juxin, but it's not a bad drug to use when it's indicated to be used. Difficult to win is a common daily scenarios in ICU. And one of the common reasons for, for, for your patients to fail weaning from mechanical ventilation is presence of heart failure. How can you wean somebody with this severe mitral regurge? You have to control this regurge. You have to control the systolic function. You have to improve the cardiac output before you attempt to wean patients from mechanical ventilation, as we mentioned in details in the presentation of weaning from mechanical ventilation. To sum up, and I'm so sorry for being a bit late, but acute heart failure is a very frequent cardiac in cardiac ICU and in general ICU, very encountered problem in ICU. We have to be aware of typical and atypical presentations of heart failure in ICU. Consider to put in the differential diagnosis of any acute type of chronic respiratory failure or any patient with respiratory failure that the respiratory failure is due to cardiac failure. And please consider to put in differential diagnosis of any tachycardic patients, not only fever or sepsis or anxiety or pain, but it might be due to heart failure. And also lung ultrasonography is found to be very far away better than just X-ray. And we have to pass the borders of having daily routine chest X-rays in ICU, but to have daily routine lung ultrasonography. And we have to practice this. ECHO is mandatory, ladies and gentlemen. And we should not underestimate this. Use the needed therapy. While you see what's going on functionally and anatomically before you decide the way of management. And this is, cannot be done without ECHO examination. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Ashraf Tayar, for this uh, fruitful presentation, as usual. Um, so the first question here, I know you're supporting much uh, or you're going against the static parameters to the dynamic parameters, but the question here is, could you please explain how to measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure using echocardiography? You can stop your presentation, Dr. Ashraf, if you wish. Okay. There are a lot of evidence on using E to A prime and E to A ratio uh, for uh, filling the pressure of the left ventricle. Uh, as far as you go above E to A prime, above 14, the more is the pulmonary capillary to be, to be uh, above uh, uh, 18. Of course, you have to have uh, in mind the limitations of this. Uh, it's uh, sometimes very difficult to have tissue doubler examination, but if you see tricuspid regurge and jet is above three, tricuspid regurge jet, if you see a bietral dilation and with every systolic function by eyeballing, you would expect that the, there is a bad diastolic dysfunction. The surrogate of diastolic function is the filling pressure of the left ventricle, which is the pulmonary capillary ridge pressure. Perfect. So this is the first <clears throat> question. And the second question is how to differentiate between ARDS and cardiogenic. So what's the difference between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema if we're using the echo? Okay, great. Uh, in very simple way, when you have pulmonary edema, you have extensive B lines bilaterally. When you have extensive B lines bilaterally, look at uh, some other uh, points. Number one, you start with the pleura, pleural line. If the pleural line is shiny and the B lines moves with the pleural line very smoothly and these B lines are confluent, equally distributed bilaterally, 
in patients with history of heart disease or history of presentation or presenting with sign or symptom of heart disease with no signs of disease deplora, this is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If you see confluent B lines with what looks like disease deplora, adhesed deplora, thickened, corrugated pleura, this is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And you would see that they are unevenly distributed. So you see it patchy, bilateral. So you see it on the right side, on, on the mid-axillary line. When you go to the left mid-axillary, you wouldn't see it. If you are in the same lung, you might see spared area. So you see it in the mid-axillary line. When you slide the probe up or down to another intercostal space, you might see area of no B-lines at all. Or you might see B-lines here, and then you see consolidation signs beside or far from this area. So patchy distribution and even haphazard distribution of abnormalities matching with uh, ERDS, not with uh, cardiogenic pulmonary, of course. This is, has to be put in the context of presentation, history, physical, and laboratory. So patient presenting with fever, young age, sign and symptom of pneumonia, and you see confluent B lines, dirty pleura, then this is straightforward ARDS. But the message again, that not every patient who is septic is having septic cardiac function hyperdynamic cardiac function or normal dynamic cardiac function. They might be septic, but they have cardiogenic abnormalities or what we call it septic cardiomyopathy, which is encountered in around 50 to 60% of cases. 50 to 60% of septic patients, they need inotropic support because of low cardiac output. People, they still believe that every septic patient, especially in the area of corona, they still believe that every shock patients who are septic, they are septic shock. They might be cardiogenic shock in septic patients. Perfect. I think the message is clear. Uh, so, uh, Professor Ahmad Mahdi uh, is one of our talent speakers and he has a question here. How much will you dry your patient with heart failure during the weaning process? And is there any rule of ultrasound and echo during this drying process? A uh, very, very good question. And there are a lot of research on this, Dr. Ahmed. If you just write uh, on uh, anywhere, in, 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 in any pop med or anything, just write heart and lung and weaning, you're going to see a lot gush of literature to support evidence saying that a dry lung is far away better than wet lung and weaning. So people, they go with cardiac output measurement with E to E prime, E to A ratio, to have evidence of failing pressure that are under control. The time of a spontaneous breathing trial is very stressful for the heart. And there is what we call it weaning induced pulmonary edema, which is very frequent, a reason for heart failure. So what to do? Number one, lung ultrasound examination, especially in the mid axillary and posterior axillary line for looking for B lines bilateral, number one. Number two, go to the heart and see the systolic function, cardiac output, measure the cardiac output, and you have to have VTI near to normal, 15 or more. And then E to E prime, less than 14, if you can. And some people, they might say, reach up to 18, the average, not the median of the lateral. And as far as the E to A, uh, e to A ratio is less than eight and more than 0.8, you are in the safe context. So you can use all effort, including the vasodilators, after root reducing agents, anotropic support even, nitroglycerin, morphine during the weaning to reduce the preload. All these measures and considered to use non-invasive immediately post extubation, especially in patients with history of cardiac diseases, they might fail immediately because of cardiac failure. These are the parameters that we used to, to go with. Uh, one of the interesting articles uh, I had read myself about the spontaneous breathing trial uh, with ultrasound or echo guidance pre and post. So they do the EA ratio and EE prime pre the weaning trial. And once uh, the weaning is started like for 30 minutes or one hour, they do assess the EA ratio and EE prime and measure. And this is on its own uh, is an indicator of failure versus success of the weaning trial. I'm sure that you had read this article as well, but it's yeah, very and, promising. 
I, I, I personally do this uh, uh, every day in my patient before we eat. We do the, 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 the echo assessment pre, during, and after the spontaneous breathing trial. And if we see evidence that the patient will not tolerate, either you go with non-invasive immediately or you delay the extubation. I have a patient currently whom I am dialyzing every day to bring down the, the uh, congestion parameters to the minimum uh, as, as we could. And mitral regurg is very common, by the way, and very, very serious to disturb the weaning uh, process. Uh, perfect. So we have loads of questions, Dr. Ashraf, but unfortunately, it's an hour from the start of our webinar. So I think we stop questions here. Thanks very much. And we do really appreciate uh, your share with us tonight. And we are proceeding to the next uh, lecture of tonight's webinar with Dr. Hazim Yassin. Uh, Dr. Hazim Yassin is an anesthesia and critical care consultant, uh, graduated 30 years back from Ain Shams University. So he has 30 years of experience, 17 uh, in uh, in Saudi Arabia and 13 in Egypt. He's currently the chairman of the disaster uh, management uh, committee and he's a team leader in rapid response team and he's a leader and instructor in, in the all the advanced cardiac life support courses, trauma management courses. So he has vast experience in the quality training and teaching. Uh, so uh, he's talking tonight about anesthesia and uh, trauma uh, management in as a rapid response team of abdominal pelvic trauma. So one of the most interesting topics, uh, shock management and behind. Uh, Dr. Hazim, uh, thanks for coming and showing up today uh, with us uh, in uh, anesthesia and critical care refresher course, and please go ahead. Thank you. Your mic is muted, Dr. Hazim. Assalamu alaikum. It sounds clear? Yeah, perfect. All good. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walid, for uh, this great opportunity. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be in, uh, in such a great academy, uh, which I feel uh, uh, more than it is life-saving academy, it is a future academy, because uh, it was one of the premier uh, uh, organizations for uh, online learning and uh, a lot of uh, uh, subjects and uh, really uh, I, I'm very honored to be after uh, Professor Ashraf Tayar, uh, a great uh, worldwide uh, critical uh, ecologist. Uh, for this subject I am interested really to share you uh, some of the knowledge about the anesthesia and the management of abdominal and pelvic trauma. Uh, really, I will not concentrate too much on the OR uh, time. I will, my concentration will be on the pre-operative preparation and management of uh, such patients, because really uh, the main concern for the pre-operative timing, it's called the golden hour. Uh, the statement of this chapter, it's a great chapter. Uh, management of uh, trauma patient is a great chapter. Uh, the statement of uh, this uh, chapter about abdominal and pelvic trauma is, it is the commonest cause of preventable death among all trauma cases. And the abdominal trauma really is frequent event in multiple traumatized patients in the presence of extra abdominal injuries and sepsis has a significant impact on the outcome. Our objectives will be described uh, firstly on the epidemiology, uh, especially, and I, uh, I choose the two countries for the epidemiology, USA and Qatar. As really we have deficiency in most of our Arab and the world and the East uh, world in the statistics. We uh, also will understand about the diagnosis resuscitation, stabilization, and management of the uh, major abdominal and pelvic traumas. We will generate also uh, how can we uh, evaluate the trauma according to the uh, history and mechanism of injury and physical examination. We will list the images, mortalities, and uh, adjuncts uh, helping us in the diagnosis and management. And 
we appreciate the necessity of emergent surgical intervention in certain abdominal trauma conditions. For the epidemiology in USA, what do you manage that 232,000 deaths per year for trauma, 2,800,000 hospital admission for traumatized patients, 39 million ED visits, the injuries cost USA 671 billion in 2013. 32% of it was fatal injuries, about 214 billion, and non-fatal injuries was about 68%. In Qatar, I chose one study for, uh, it was from 2011 to 2028 uh, to 2011, about uh, 6,000. 888 trauma patients who were admitted to the hospital. 15% of them was abdominal trauma. The mean age of them was 30 plus 13, means uh, from 16 age to uh, 45. 93% of them was males and females. Of course, all females are, uh, are so cautious and uh, avoiding the accidents, so only 7%. Motor vehicle crash was 61%. Fall from height was 25%. Fall of heavy objects was 7%. Others was 5%. These others, including induced, uh, maybe uh, surgical complications, maybe uh, uh, inadvertent events in the OR or in the hospital. The common associated injuries with the abdominal and pelvic trauma was chest, 35%, musculoskeletal, 32%, head injuries, 24%. The main complications was wound infection, pneumonia, UTI. Mortality rate was 8%. Uh, early, 6% of them, and late, 2%, about severe head injuries and sepsis. The predictors of the mortality was head injuries and uh, injury severity score, blood transfusion, and serum lactate. Why we are caring about this epidemiologically? Because at the golden hour, the first hour of injury, 50% of the patient was severe, fully traumatized, die at the first few minutes. And 30% of these patients die in the next few hours. Only 20% leave for few days or weeks and die from sepsis and the multi-organ system failure. We will have a case uh, as, uh, as a rule for, uh, for us to, uh, while we are discussing the case, we will go through the rest of our objectives. You are in the middle of your shift, you just uh, beginning your lunch, and your major bleed for a trauma call, uh, code amber, and as an anesthetist, you are either the leader or one of the uh, trauma team. You were informed that 23 years old male stabbing victim with a single stab wound to the abdomen, multiple abrasions, contusions, lacerations to the extremities, is awake and protecting his airway, but the abdomen is distended and his blood pressure is only 90 over 50. Pulse is 118, respiratory rate 24 per minute and expected time of arrival four minutes. The first question comes to your mind. What this patient might have? Of course, it will run a checklist in your mind. How would you approach this patient? This patient with abdominal trauma, with a stab wound in the abdomen, how would you approach? Of course, all of you knows that the most advanced protocols are the American uh, College of Surgeon protocol, which 
ATLS Advanced Trauma Life Support which mnemonics A, B, C, D, E We will follow the Advanced Trauma Life Support Protocol which is A, airway, B, breathing, C, circulation, D, instability, E, exposure and environmental How would we manage the patient? As we said, all the trauma patient should be approach it according to the ATLS algorithm. Why? These people began more than 40 years ago. They have a great impact and thousands of scientists, surgeons, anesthetists from all the world shared in this recent updated ATLS algorithm and program. Airway maintenance with cervical spine protection, be breathing, with uh, uh, tension pneumothorax and management, circulation with control of hemorrhage, disability with the log roll, and exposure with the environmental control. And I'm telling you a secret. If the patient is here and you are in the ER and you feel comfort with the environment, be sure that the patient is hypothermic because the room temperature is suitable only for the staff. It's not suitable for the patient. What are the adjuncts for the primary survey? The patient primary survey needs ECG capnography, arterial blood gas laboratory tasks, uh, blood uh, done, chest X-ray, pelvis X-ray, urinary catheter, and fast examination. And of course, uh, the uh, Dr. Walid and Dr. Ashraf is using the sonar and echo. Uh, abdominal examination, how to catch the abdominal examination. We, we, we knew from the history that the patient airway is intact, he is breathing well, he is talking well, he is only have hypotension, tachycardia. Then we, we bypass the airway and, and the breathing and go to the circulation. Of course, the patient will have two big IV lines and we will connect uh, the ECG monitor and pulse oximeter and the capnography and we will uh, insert uh, colloid one liter uh, fast and we will make the exact after the chest examination we will do the abdominal examination by inspection, palpation, auscultation, percussion and we will need fast examination which is assisted sonography for trauma. What is the mechanism of the abdominal trauma? The mechanism of abdominal trauma, why we should know it? From the mechanism, from the history of the abdominal trauma and the correlation with the anatomy, which we already oriented from the first years of medical school, we can raise our suspicions to the organ affected. So, if a blunt trauma, we will think in the organ affected according. If the blunt trauma to the right side, we will think in the uh, right hypochondrium, right upper hypochondrium, we will think about liver, we will think about the pancreas, we will think uh, about uh, colon, we will think about right kidney. If to the right left side, we will think about stomach, we will think about spleen. We will uh, uh, think about duodenum. We will think if in the epigastrium, we will think uh, about diaphragm. We will think about stomach. If penetrating, which is less frequent because blunt trauma in the abdomen constitute about 90% of the trauma, but penetrating, it's only 10%. And you will not imagine that the blunt trauma is most dangerous and most fatal. Why? really because it has multi-organ injuries. Another thing, most of the time are masked with any non-lethal injuries, amputated finger, uh, dislocation elbow, uh, whatever external trauma, and never be hacked by, never let this trick happen uh, to you that no abrasions, very few abrasions on the abdomen, and you exclude serious abdominal trauma. So we will take any blunt trauma seriously,
as it is lethal until proved otherwise. This is the gunshot penetrating injury to the abdomen. What it can affect gunshot? It will affect most common injured organs in the penetrating abdominal injury. The gunshot will take small bowel first, colon, liver, vasculature, most commonly by from the most common to the least common. Stab wound, it will take liver, stomach, diaphragm, colon, and uh, small bowel. Stab wound penetrating abdominal fascia, it considered an OR order. It is an order to the surgeon, you take me to the OR for exploratory laparotomy. But if the stab wound doesn't penetrate the abdominal fascia, it means it is superficial, maybe it is, uh, uh, was uh, just playing or accidental, so it is not indicated for laparotomy. It only needs close observation and follow-up. Peritonitis, of if the peritonitis is uh, concomitant, if peritonitis is clear, so we will do fast if the fast is positive for contamination for any uh, like content or, or any blood we will go through or laparotomy also how adjuncts can help us in the uh, decision of uh, or laparotomy by physical examination and by fast examination with CT scan, the surgeon can decide if this patient is for exploration laparotomy or not. Why CT scan after fast? And when we take the patient to the CT scan, never move the patient from the ED to any laboratory or radiological investigation until he is stable. If the patient hemodynamically stable, we can take him to give more uh, radiological studies, to do uh, angiography, to do uh, CT scan, brain and chest and abdomen and pelvis and whatever. But if the patient hemodynamically unstable with blunt trauma, we will go through fast examination and maximum to DPL, which is which is diagnostic la laparotomy, diagnostic uh, uh, laparoscopic la la lavage, which can decide if there is blood more than 100 ml, if there is uh, intestinal content, and if there is positive, with stable hemodynamics, we'll go for further investigations. With unstable hemodynamics, we we'll go directly to the operating theater for exploration laboratory. The patient now is going to exploration laboratory. All of us, most of us are anesthetists. What comes to your mind of complications can happen to the patients? What are the challenges for you in the OR? There are three triads of trauma. There are lethal triads of trauma, three killers. If the anesthetist should avoid the first one is coagulopathy, of course. The second one is the metabolic acidosis. The third one is hypothermia. And it is a vicious circuit. Once coagulopathy, it will lead to metabolic acidosis, it will lead to hypothermia, which is already present with the patient who is hypovolemic and with the cold extremities, and it will induce coagulopathy, of course, which will need a separate, uh, a separate presentation. Why anesthesiologists are involved in the care of trauma patients. Why we did not go from the beginning of the presentation 
to the patient. You have patient in the OR uh, for exploration laparotomy. The anesthesiologist is one of three. Either he is one of the trauma team, so he will be in the emergency department during the code umbrella or during the uh, trauma code. And he might be the anesthesiologist for polytraumatized patient in the OR. The third anesthesiologist, he will, he will take the patient in the ICU. He will care for the uh, post-operative care management and for the pain management. So the anesthetist should be involved in the whole process of trauma. Why anesthesia patient? for the other is different by many differentiations. First one, it comes in the off hours, in the off time, with short, with, uh, with uh, an anesthesia technician, with shortage of, uh, with the least of the OR nurses. And the second, the patient is not prepared. The patient, mostly in, in the patient also, is supposed to have deficiency of knowledge. We have deficiency of history. We have, we have no previous history. Maybe, maybe the patient has no relatives, has, has nothing. We, we have only a victim, but we don't have any data about the patient. And mostly, or most of the times, patient is intoxicated either uh, on drugs or uh, al alcohol intake with a full stomach. And also, we have the challenge of cervical instability, especially if there is a, a, a deceleration uh, me mechanism, uh, especially if there is long extrication from the car. What are the areas? In the OR, we should stress in the management of the anesthesia of trauma patient more than the regular routine OR operation. Simple operation may be, become complicated, especially the surgery, anesthesia equipment, short notice. Patient often multiple injuries, maybe has uh, uh, traumatic uh, Injury, uh, different occult injuries such as tension pneumothorax. Maybe the patient during assessment in the ER has no tension pneumothorax, maybe he has minimal. And once he is intubated and with assisted ventilation, you will find the patient desaturated, severe hypotension. Bradycardia about arrest. How can how it comes? If the patient was on room air, the, his saturation is 90, is 85. Once you intubated the patient and you begin your assisted ventilation, the patient's saturation became 70, heart rate became 40, and in audible pressure. Immediately you think that maybe the patient has a minor pneumothorax, which is changed to tension pneumothorax with the positive pressure ventilation. What about the trauma care for this anesthesiologist? The injured patient should be discussion for the airway management. Of course, there will be a great challenge in the airway management. Uh, ED doctor, maybe ED doctor, maybe uh, uh, surgeons who is advanced trauma life support uh, provider who, is, uh, who was trained in the course about uh, airway management and uh, emergency intubation, but it comes from day to day that the anesthesiologist is the playmaker, is the joker for the airway management. Nobody can go through with. And also the post-operative time is 
very critical. Resuscitation for, uh, for shock also is a challenge. The priorities for the trauma care is A, B, C, D, even during the ED type or even the laparotomy operation. The airway measurement is, should be very clear. Dope can happen, uh, desaturation, uh, an airway uh, management problem can happen by maybe dislodgement of the tube, maybe obstruction, uh, maybe kinking, maybe uh, blood, maybe foreign body. Uh, also, uh, tension pneumothorax can happen and equipment failure. Sometimes, especially in, in small hospitals, uh, maybe uh, there is no checklist uh, daily uh, for for the equipment, for the portable ventilator, for the ambu bag, and a lot of events happen and we all uh, see. And the patient in cardiac arrest, even, or in pending cardiac arrest, the, maybe the equipment uh, doesn't give you the, uh, the, the right uh, uh, numbers and you can depend mostly on your clinical sense. What do we need? For, uh, for this uh, such patient. We need laboratory, CBC, complete uh, blood count, uh, CT scan, ECG, uh, the fast uh, follow-up for the neurological status. The causes of obstruction, as we told, the direct injury to the uh, airway, to the tube, uh, hemorrhage, diminished conscious, and all of this can happen during the transportation from the ED to the uh, radiological uh, department or from the ED to the OR. Pulmonary contusion can happen. Also, a great challenge for any anesthetist is continuous hemorrhage, which cannot be controlled by the surgeon. So, anesthetist can keep with the permissive hypotension, but with the clear uh, uh, perfusion and with the good monitoring of urine output. Symptoms of shock, the pallor, the phoresis, the hypotension, the tachycardia, prolonged capillary refill, diminished urine output, narrow pulse, neurological status, should be considered from the beginning by following up the Glasgow Coma Scale. And as long as the, uh, the neurological status is, is followed, it reduces the medical legal aspects for the trauma team, for the anesthetist, for the uh, surgeon. If all of you has know about the, uh, the, the EMV uh, uh, of the Glasgow Coma Scale, no need to read. The final step for the primary survey is complete exposure for the patient to see any other hidden uh, trauma. Although the ABCDE issues must be addressed first, but we uh, must not forget the pulses extremity, the compartmental syndrome, the near amputation, the massively fractured limbs. Surgical priorities in trauma patient. The airway management and crico thyroidotomy is considered a failed intubation after two successive times with between five minutes in between with uh, the more expert and the most senior anesthetist in, uh, on the scene. Once the patient to go to the OR, there should be special setting for this trauma patient. It is level one fast uh, uh, fluids and uh, the, uh, the machines which give us the, uh, the very, uh, uh, very fast fluids up to 800 milliliter 
per minute. Emergency airway management, all know the indications, anesthetic uh, induction. For the anesthetic inductions, mostly we use uh, etimidate uh, because it's the most, uh, most suitable uh, uh, anesthesia uh, induction agent for the unstable hemodynamics. Uh, succinyl choline, if the, uh, uh, if the trauma uh, below six, uh, six hours, or uh, chromium, and fentanyl or narcotic according to the presence. The airway management also should be done for uh, about to arrest, respiratory insufficiency, airway protection, the approach should be through the monitoring with the pulse oximeter, ECG, capnography. In all cases, we should consider the patients are full stomach with the uh, cricoid pressure, silex maneuver, pre-oxygenation is a must. The most important element in endotracheal intubation, which most of the anesthetists, most, most of the ED, most of the physicians forget, is cervical spine in line stabilization. So the intubation process, I insisted and I repeated, and we should repeat every time, the intubation process for from, for, from three to four individuals, four providers should be present. The anesthetist and the assistant who is preparing the medication and the one who is aligning, making the aligning the, uh, the cervical uh, spine uh, alignment. During this, the neck collar is present. It is removed smoothly and the uh, the uh, assistant making the protection against inline stabilization. Also, we can use a uh, glide scope to uh, uh, make the process of intubation uh, easier. Also, a fourth provider can administer the anesthetic medications. Additional assessment for combative patients until uh, he is stabilizing the endotracheal tube, securing. Anesthesia induction, of course, it's humidate, ketamine can be given for profound hypotension. Down to none, the dose of anesthetic must be decreased in the presence of hemorrhage, down to none. We can give, sometimes we say, we give saline for induction. Because the patient has inaudible blood pressure, has severe bradycardia, or uncompromised hemodynamics. So, in life-threatening hypovolemia, we can do down to none. We can give zero anesthetic induction. And inhibition of memory formation, we can give scopolamine and midazolam if the hemodynamics permit. Neuromuscular blocking agent, as we said, saxonylcholine, we will begin with uh, uh, only minimal amount and recronium can be given and vicronium can be given also. Uh, Sugamadex, can be given in the induction. Spontaneous ventilation during intubation, we can permit awake intubation. And if difficult intubation, we can proceed also for awake fiber optic if there is no uh, airway compromising. And adjuncts for intracale intubation. Uh, gum elastic bouger with the stylet, esophageal combi tube, laryngeal airway mask, Oral versus nasotracheal, of course, oral uh, route is preferred. For facial and laryngeal trauma, sure, 
facial and pharyngeal trauma, we proceed from the beginning to definitive airway by mainly cricothyroidotomy or tracheostomy. Resuscitation from hemorrhage. Resuscitation fluids uh, usually uh, is uh, crystalloids for one liter, but the blood has the priority uh, over the, uh, the crystalloids. or negative blood can be given by the, as we see the shock cascade. And the platelets and fresh frozen plasma also is given by a uh, one, one, one ratio. Specific organ system respond to traumatic shock, which is the CNS and kidney, which is the most uh, sensitive uh, organ and system for the uh, stable hemodynamics. And it is a very good indicator. Your output is a very good indicator for the good perfusion. Resuscitation early by and late early while the active bleeding by one liter crystalloid, then or negative blood until the blood bank prepare the cross matched blood and late by the control of bleeding. How can we control the bleeding? By life saving surgeries. Early resuscitation can, can, can be done either pre hospital or in the ED, and later resuscitation can be done in the OR and in the uh, post-operative uh, time in the uh, ICU. What is the risk associated with the replacement during the early uh, resuscitation? Increased the blood pressure, decreased viscosity, of course, coagulopathy, as we said, the lethal triad, decreased the clotting factors, greater transfusion requirements, disruption of electrolyte imbalance, direct immune suppression, premature uh, reperfusion, increased risk of hypothermia. So all fluids, all the blood products should be warmed, warmed saline, warmed back the RBCs, warmed fresh frozen plasma. What is the goal and algorithm uh, emphasis on? Rapid diagnosis and the control of ongoing hemorrhage to restore vascular volume. So, an anesthetist presence in the uh, first golden hour uh, in the emergency department is very crucial. Why? Because he is the fastest one who can make a two uh, wide caliber, wide gauge IV lines. He can do emergency central line. He can do emergency CVB, which should be replaced after 24 hours or uh, at maximum uh, uh, 48 hours, 24 hours to for uh, CLAPSI, but it is life saving. Who can, we can in very close uh, limits, we can give in a tropic support for some cardiac patients, for some uh, uh, old age who is not responding properly for the fluid resuscitation. The goals of early resuscitation to maintain blood pressure about more than 90 systolic, maintain hematocrit more than 25, maintain the prothrombin and the uh, INR within, uh, within upper limits, maintain platelet count more than 50,000, Maintain normal serum ionized calcium, maintain temperature above 35 because hypothermia is one of the three lethal uh, weapons uh, in the trauma. Maintain function of pulse oximetry, warm extremities, prevent the increase of serum lactate, prevent acidosis and worsening, but also acidosis is one of the three killers. Achieve adequate anesthesia and analgesia. And really, it needs titration maybe every second. What is the algorithm of management of early hemorrhagic shock? The early hemorrhagic shock should be managed by diagnosis, 
and by the support ABC, oxygen, intubation, ventilation, and the uh, blood O negative until the cross matching. Early intubation is a great uh, impact, and so it needs the, uh, the anesthetist to be on the trauma team. Resuscitation fluids, as we said, isotonic crystalloids, colloids, uh, packed RBCs, plasma, platelet by the ratio one to one to one, one packed RBCs, one uh, platelet, one plasma. Late resuscitation is reconstructive. Uh, uh, surgery is life-saving surgery and definitive control by the surgeon or the angiography and uh, practitioner uh, goes to restore normal perfusion to the vital organs brain liver kidney which is life saving to any patient late resuscitation the adequacy of resuscitation should not be judged by the presence of normal vital signs, but normalization of organ and tissue perfusion. This means we should not be tricked by the blood pressure who is close to normal. This is not the target. The target is the proper vital organs perfusion. Blood pressure 110 over 60 is not my target. My target is Good urine output, more than one milliliter per kg uh, per hour. My target is uh, stable uh, entitled carbon dioxide. My target is uh, pH above 7.3. My target is temperature uh, above uh, 35%. The goals of the rate resuscitation maintain blood pressure above 100 and above uh, individual transfusion, normalize coagulation, normalize the electrolyte, normalize body temperature, restore normal urine output, maximize cardiac output if, of course, if uh, the swan gans or the transesophageal echo with our uh, professor, uh, Dr. Ashraf, uh, uh, will help us, Dr. Walid can help us in uh, transesophageal echo and the uh, follow up of the fluid status in the uh, ICU, post operative or intraoperative, occult high perfusion syndrome is common in post-operative in the ICU and in the OR. How? This normal blood pressure, this is a tricky, maintained by systemic vasoconstriction or any tropic support or, but still intravascular volume is low and still cardiac output is low, but the use of transesophageal echo and transthoracic echo, even in the OR or in the uh, ICU, it will uh, solve this uh, this problem, and we will not fall in this tricky of occult hypoperfusion syndrome, as long as there will be organ system ischemia presents uh, persist in uh, most of the vital organs the patient will be on high risk of multi-organ system failure. The, the problem will begin with the kidney, uh, with the acute kidney injury, then it will go through hypervolemia, it will go through uh, 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 metabolic acidosis, it will go through coagulopathy, it will be this vicious circuit, as we told the lethal weapon. What is, how to choose the kind of uh, anesthesia? Of course, it should be either regional anesthesia or uh, general anesthesia or combined. Regional anesthesia advantage allow a continued assessment of the mental status. This is the most important advantage of regional anesthesia. You can control and you can monitor the neurological status as long as uh, whole operation. Increase the vascular flow, uh, avoid airway manipulation. But regional anesthesia should be given in a patient who is their airway are appreciable. Never, we never begin regional anesthesia for a patient because his airway cannot be maintained. Never. Because at any time, maybe the regional anesthesia fail, maybe 
the, the surgery extend beyond the time of, uh, of uh, regional anesthesia. So we will need to induce general anesthesia, which we cannot do it properly intraoperative. Improve postoperative mental status and decrease the blood loss, and especially in head operations. Decreased incidence of deep venous thrombosis, improved postoperative analgesia, and better pulmonary toilet, of course. What is the disadvantage? Disadvantage, peripheral nerve function difficult to assess, patient refusal sometimes, re uh, requirement of sedation, which we, we may avoid for uh, respiratory uh, embarrassment, hemodynamic instability with the placement, because the local we give it, uh, we give the medication and we wait for the result. But the general anesthesia, we called it, we override the patient. No suitable for multiple body regions. If there is multiple uh, trauma uh, organs, uh, maybe off before procedure conclude. General anesthesia. This is the master of uh, and the best. Uh, actually, I prefer it in, in most cases. Yeah. The advantage: speed of onset. It is immediate. No, no, no preparatory time. Within few seconds, we can uh, induce general anesthesia. The duration. It, uh, it is expandable. We can do general anesthesia for 24 hours, for uh, whatever. Uh, allow multiple procedures to be done in multiple organs, multiple areas of the body. Greater uh, patient acceptance. Uh, allow positive pressure ventilation, which is, this is one of the most advantage. Because most of the trauma patients, especially for abdominal, blunt abdominal trauma, has some sort of Thoraco abdominal involvement and mostly have some pulmonary contusions, which may be uh, not clear in the radiological because it comes late, because radiological findings comes late. And even oscillatory findings, it will not be clear that in the ED uh, there is pulmonary contusion. Also, the X-ray will not provide it until we do Chest CT, maybe uh, uh, clearing the presence of pulmonary contusions. The disadvantage is impaired the global neurological examination. You cannot you, you cannot uh, judge uh, what is the mental status as long as the patient in the intraoperative and even in the postoperative uh, uh, anesthesia unit required airway and instrumentation, hemodynamic. Uh, management more complex, increased potential for barotrauma if uh, it is not well properly managed by the anesthetist. Tracheobronchial injury is one of the challenges for any anesthetist in thoraco abdominal trauma because tracheobronchial injury is even resistant for the chest tube. It might need one chest tube two chest tubes, three chest tubes, four chest tubes. It may need two chest tubes on the right, two on the left. It may need a cardio thoracic surgeon who, uh, who can uh, go through uh, a rigid bronchoscopy uh, to the patient who can help us. But really, tracheobronchial injury is a very bad complication which might face any perfect anesthetist because it happened with the blunt trauma with the tracheobronchial tree within uh, two centimeters of the, from the carina. The presence of subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum also, uh, pneumopericardium, uh, pneumoperitoneum without apparent cause, it will be reflectly uh, for diagnosis of tracheobronchial injury. Traumatic aortic injury, I will not talk about it, it is uh, uh, too much treatment. Uh, of course, we have only, uh, if there is, uh, there is no uh, a vascular surgeon, you can only uh, give some beta blockers to minimize the cardiac rate pressure and stabilize the patient until uh, a vascular or thoracic uh, surgeon comes or to be transferred to a higher trauma center if you are in a small hospital. Rib fractures, it is uh, already managed uh, uh, conservative, 
and it is self-healing only if you found many rib fractures you should expect pulmonary contusions on the same side if you found flail chest you should uh, prepare yourself if you can uh, arrange for chest tubes and if you can arrange for uh, thoracic uh, epidural analgesia selected patients population what if the trauma happened to a geriatric patient he is uh, polytraumatized of course all of us knows the physiological and the anatomical changes in geriatric patients how their uh, lung is, uh, is less reservoir, how this functional reservoir capacity, how his uh, uh, joints, how his, uh, how his blood pressure, how his medications for hypertension, for diabetes, and so on, so on, so So all these factors should be considered. What if a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman has two indications for uh, specific factors. The trauma team will be three trauma team instead of trauma team. Will be one trauma team for the patient as a victim. Second trauma team will be obstetric team, obstetricians who are ready for life saving uh, cesarean section in the AD maybe. Third team, neonatologist. So three teams will manage uh, this patient for the trauma team. Never forget to put the patient on the left lateral to avoid porto cavel compression for the gravid uterus, the big gravid uterus, especially in the third trimester for reducing the blood pressure. You will find the blood pressure dropping without uh, clear cause of uh, Hemorrhage, it might be this portocable compression. Uh, Juvan's witness patient who has this uh, Jewish who doesn't uh, accept blood transfusion, you should respect. Of course, they are not in our Arab world, but we should respect their presence everywhere. If you are working in, uh, of course, in Europe or uh, uh, any foreign countries, uh, we should respect their uh, wish and you uh, consider the uh, colloids, you consider the plasma expanders. Trauma and the pregnancy, this is high risk for spontaneous abortion, preterm labor. The best treatment for developing the fetus is proper treatment of the mother. When we terminate, beta agonist can help at magnesium, when we can, we should terminate pregnancy immediately. We should terminate a, a pregnancy immediately if the mother in the extremes, uterus is uh, itself is traumatized and the gravid uterus is impairing surgical control. The surgeon cannot, with the big gravid uterus, cannot go through the traumatized organ in, in the abdomen. So RH also should be considered. Post-operative care, emergence and tracheal intubation. We uh, avoid dope uh, dislodgement, obstruction, uh, pneumothorax, uh, equipment failure. We control acute pain management as all of you are uh, the best painkiller in the world. And uh, I'm really, uh, I, I want another <laughs> two hours <laughs> to continue this chapter. Maybe Dr. Walid, inshallah, uh, give us the chance to uh, uh, concentrate more in the uh, intra-operative uh, uh, time. But for the perioperative uh, management, all over, please, please keep eye on the whole, the whole hemodynamics of the patients, as these patients can deteriorate at any time. And all trauma patients are full of surprises. Never get rest as long as the patient in the ICU. And uh, uh, grateful thanks for you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hazim, uh, for this comprehensive, it's really comprehensive one, and I know trauma patients is like,
uh, is the whole book in one patient. So you can you can never be satisfied with your management. <clears throat> Just for sake of time, we'll go straight forward to the question. And the first question, do you have uh, to stabilize cardiac patient with acute abdominal injury in ICU preoperatively or immediately to theater? If we have a cardiac patient, do we stay uh, I, and play? I, I or so I, I have a patient who is cardiac patient needs uh, stabilization from cardiac point of view, and he is an acute trauma as well. Yes. So what's your decision? The decision for the cardiac patient uh, that you uh, stabilize the patient uh, as long as you are avoiding severe hypotension and severe pain. You 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 make good hemodynamic control, you compensate the, uh, the, the hemorrhage by the minimal colloid and the uh, back the RBCs, platelet plasma, and you control pain because pain in the cardiac patient is the, uh, the, the, the very, uh, very crucial and the very, uh, uh, very important as it increases the catecholamines and it is make coronary spasm and, and uh, can induce uh, non STMI and, and it will worsen the condition if the patient has multivalvular uh, disease or uh, acute coronary syndrome and uh, stabilization of the patient, uh, uh, frequent, uh, frequent monitoring, uh, recent echo, uh, frequent ECGs will uh, reduce all the complications can happen to this cardiac patient. Okay, perfect. So um, let's go to the second question here, which is how to minimize the IC uh, complication from massive blood transfusion after major trauma, particularly the major trauma itself may be the cause of the DIC. Uh, uh, the, 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 the one who will minimize is the surgeon. We, we need a competent surgeon to help us in the uh, secondary control of the uh, uh, of the bleeding, uh, as long as we anesthetist uh, all his role to stabilize the patient, to compensate for the hemorrhage in the primary uh, stage, but in the secondary stage, it depends a lot on the surgeon. Uh, it depends a lot on the management uh, intraoperative. Uh, reducing the uh, the coagulopathies uh, already that uh, uh, a lot of uh, procedures should be done locally uh, reducing the source of, of hemorrhage and when uh, giving the back the RBCs it should be by the ratio as we said back the RBCs plasma platelets which actually and uh, is not uh, actually is not so frequent in in, in, in most of the uh, small hostels, but really it should be uh, it should be done uh, with the uh, with the small hostels like the large hostels. Each blood bank should has a platelet, should has a fresh frozen plasma. Uh, okay, Dr. Hazim, uh, I have a question myself. Uh, in the lecture, you mentioned about etomidate. Uh, etomidate is currently almost of no use in Ireland because of the adrenal suppression. And if the patient developed shock later on, is it the etomidate that we have given uh, in the induction, or it's a legitimate adrenal suppression from the trauma, or it is a septic shock? So it puts us in a dilemma. So I found in Ireland it's rarely used nowadays. So what's your input about this etomidate in the induction? Particularly, we have fentanyl and ketamine and other yes. alternatives. Personally, for myself, uh, uh, I'm the, it is the minimal uh, drug I use as long as mostly I use uh, ketamine fentanyl in, uh, in such uh, hypovolemic uh, shock with the minimal, uh, with the minimal uh, doses. Uh, but it, uh, we, we, we should mention it as it is in the, still in the literature and the, uh, still in the protocols. Uh, of the uh, American site of anesthesia and uh, uh, still in the uh, Advanced Trauma Life Support 10th edition, uh, 
uh, which uh, comes from the American uh, uh, College of Surgeon, uh, which is released uh, about seven months ago. Etumidate uh, is mentioned as the preferred uh, induction of anesthesia drugs for emergency intubation for uh, unstable hemodynamics. Uh, perfect. So just uh, we're out of time now. It's 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, so we'll stop questions here. I would like just to say thanks very much for our uh, lectures tonight. Uh, Dr. Ashraf Tayyar and uh, Dr. Hazim Nassin. Uh, and I would like to say uh, thanks for all our attendees tonight. And I have a surprise here. Um, next lecture, uh, next week, inshallah, on next Saturday, 5th of uh, September. We have a very important lecture for every single physician, not only anesthetist intensivist. So it's research work. So it is a research journey from the research question to the p-value. So it's uh, like it's a full lecture about on how to conduct research. The lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif. He is a public health and uh, a medical statistician, one of the pioneers. He is a lecturer on the Udemy uh, courses for for a long time. So please do not miss his lecture. Second lecture will be the anesthesia for liver resection, one of the highly specialized topics, and uh, it is by Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abdel uh, one of my best colleagues here in Ireland, and he's one of the uh, expert uh, speakers in when we're talking about uh, liver resection and liver transplant. He had a lot, a lot of uh, liver transplants done by himself. I would really uh, emphasize on attendance of the next session. Uh, thanks very much and have a good night and uh, see you next week, 5th of September, uh, with uh, the 12th week of Anesthesia and Critical Care Refresher course and our Saving Lives Academy. Thanks very much, Dr. Hazim, and sorry for all the Thank questions you. we were not able to answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope, inshallah, in next lectures, inshallah. Thank you very much. See you. See you. Thank you. Thank you.